Hi, Karin. How are you? Hi, Julie. I am great, and it's wonderful to be back again. Thank you. It is wonderful to have you here, Karin. Karin is joining us from Munich, and she's done some amazing work with human traffic survivors. So, Karin, do you want to talk about the work you've done with, especially with domestic violence and human traffic survivors? Yes, I work in a very specialized field, basically cross borders and conflicting laws. And I tend to spend my time trying to find some sort of a bridge between countries, states and their laws and how women and children fleeing across borders are affected by those laws and how to find a place for them to be protected from domestic violence and fleeing in crisis. Yes. Right now, one of the biggest issues we're having right now is obviously from the war in the Ukraine. Yes. So any recent cases you want to talk about, you know, because the previous video we were talking to a couple of people who are working with rehabilitation of traffic survivors. And I think any conflicts are drivers of such tra trafficking simply because there are a lot of refugees, people are trying to flee the country, they do not have the resources available to them. So anything you want to add there or any, any experience? Yeah, unfortunately, like I said, one of the uh, issues that we're working on right now is that in crossing the borders, and it's women and children again, always very, very risky. But what's happening is that a lot of people have gone there and they're posing as transportation aid or aid workers or even doctors and offering women and children a ride or they're saying we'll take you to the hospital or we'll take you to a legitimate camp and they're disappearing them. And this is becoming a very big issue already and an increased number of children are missing. So that is currently what's happening that is scary that is scary and that's exactly what we were talking about in a previous video that whenever there is migration or there is refugee situation those are the times when women and children are most vulnerable extremely vulnerable because one they've left an extreme crisis behind they're fleeing some do have family members to come to in europe in other countries yeah. Yeah. and the european countries have been very open about it but because you're dealing with a massive instant crisis of people yeah. it's very hard to get it organized quickly enough and to help people sure. um, and again women and children Many of, in Europe's last refugee crisis in 2015, we lost over 10,000 children. We still don't know where they are. Where they are, yeah. Yeah. Karin, I know that you have been <clears throat> working with various organizations addressing this issue. So do you want to talk about your work with some of the other organizations you have been attached to or where you are in an advisory capabilities? Um, I work as founder of Project Ask. Yeah. and we are currently working in this area right now i also work in specified um as a private client yeah. management for okay. international kidnapping cases okay. um that's a case-by-case -case basis and i am currently working in a political as a political analyst and part of human trafficking is on my plate <laughs> so yeah and any insight into human trafficking which you want to share with the viewers my primary angle as you know is very much from the legal side yes and while we have many international laws that right. are designed you know conventions united nations conventions against uh, transnational organized crime would be one of them the united nations protocol to prevent suppress and punish trafficking in persons uh, especially women and children, it's very targeted, and United Nations Protocol Against Smuggling of Migrants by Land, Sea, and Air. And UNOC, United Nations Office on Drug and Crimes, is heavily in, involved in these things. Yes. So you can see by just hearing the conventions, the very tight relationship between crime and human trafficking, trafficking. and yes. the vulnerability of all these people that are involved in it. Recently in the US, 
Um, I don't know if you heard about this, but they tried to pass in the California Senate a bill SB 1042, and it was aimed at curbing human trafficking in California. Mm -hmm. It would have increased the penalties for trafficking and would reclassify, this is the interesting point, reclassify human trafficking as a violent crime. Yes. So by pushing this bill forward, you understand right now that in California and in some states, it is not considered a violent crime. <laughs> so that's our first thing that we need to deal with in these issues. And, and it is a serious crime. It yeah, is a and, violent crime. And if this bill passes in California, do you think other states will follow? Right now, the bill's been kicked to the curb and they don't expect it to pass. That's sad. <laughs> shocking it's actually yes. shocking one of the main reason for you to be here is that we are you know when we are addressing the human trafficking we are always talking with ngos who are working with traffic survivors who are saving them who are reintegrating them but nobody is talking about policies and that's where you come in because we need to start talking about policies and laws and i think that is also a very integral part of you know addressing human trafficking it is, and with the best intentions of the world, and there are so many people out there doing such good work. Yes. And a lot of it privately through NGOs. Yes. But what we have is, whether it's India, whether it's Europe, whether it's the US, we have the issue of conflicting laws. Yes. And that's kind of my area. So even in between the state of California and the state of Oregon, yeah. human trafficking is defined differently, it's treated differently. Is it a violent crime? Is it not a violent crime? Um, if you go from the United States to Mexico or to Canada and then, you know, expand yourself across the world. So we have laws in each country or each state, but the problem becomes human trafficking is a global issue. It's an it international is. issue, it always. Is. Always. And unless we can find a way to address it as a global issue, we're only saving a few. So, you know, 10,000 children were missing last time. I mean, this time we already know we're missing women and children. They're lost already. And this has only been one month, the war, one yeah. month, and we're already in trouble finding, you know, losing people. Sure. So, Somehow, we need to find ways to create laws, one, with high level of enforceability. That's sure. another issue. And training, a lot of police departments, a lot of these places, they don't know what to do. Yes. They lack the training. And the little bit of training they have might be actually in conflict with the law itself. True. You know, so these are major issues that need to be dealt with. True. And I understand it's not your subject, but any other issue which is very integral part of when we are addressing human trafficking, which nobody's talking I, about or... No, uh, it's nobody really wants to talk about what happens afterwards. Yes. So you have some victims that have been rescued yes. and you get a brief they've been rescued they're okay and then the story seems to stop yeah. and nobody wants to talk about what happens afterwards to the women to the children how difficult it is to become i call it to come become a civilian again yeah. because it's almost like being in a war and fighting for your life for your child's life um and trying to have gone through that much hell of what has happened to somebody and then trying to integrate them back into what we call normal life whether it's a job or society or just going to a party can be absolutely terrifying yes. so i think if we can start talking a little bit more about what happens afterwards and that it's okay to have this fear and these emotions yes. and to accept that this trauma isn't going to disappear just because you've been rescued. It can last a long time and it can affect every part of your life. Yes. It's, yeah. 
yeah so as part of this video the next speaker would be talking about trauma and the counseling because i think the general counselors cannot address issues faced by traffickers because they are they are going through a completely different kind of a trauma and you know a specialized training is required so we will hear from him but thank you karin so much for joining me today oh, i really appreciate it and it's always good to see you <laughs> hi victor how are you i'm fine so, nice to talk to you victor is joining us specially to deal with the issue of mental health of traffic survivors so victor do you want to quickly tell us what exactly do you do yeah uh, my specialty is ptsd post traumatic stress disorder all right and this is a condition that is really widespread across the world Right. not just with trafficking survivors but with all sorts of people and there's all sorts of things that can cause it we thought originally uh, after world war 1 that it was caused by wars by explosions by seeing your fellow soldiers get injured but now it looks like ptsd can be caused by all sorts of things by watching a traumatic incident by an accident by bereavement and i find in my practice that bereavements of of people that you're close to are a particular source of PTSD and of course sexual attack sexual molestation kidnappings torture terrorist incidents and emotional abuse of severe nature can cause PTSD as well right and since we are specifically talking about traffic survivors how is you know the counseling which you do or the work you do maybe throw some light onto the work you're doing at the same time how is it different from any other counselor who will be counseling those survivors okay so we, i do two different things i train counselors right. and i give counseling but here we're talking mostly about with trafficking survivors what i like to do is train them to give each other sessions and i'm doing that successfully in cameroon and in kenya at the moment right so this fairly easy technique to learn two particular techniques there's one for traumatic incidents and there's one for traumatic relationships and typically anybody who's been through an experience like trafficking will have both there'll be people they've had a traumatic relationship with and there'll be people that and there'll be incidents as well so we need to address both and typically we find on average 6 7 sessions will take somebody from having ptsd to not having ptsd so that's what i'm training survivors to do with their fellow survivors because there's so many of them that just one therapist going into an area alone is never going to work this has got to be something that peer counseling what everybody a skill that people have to learn to help each other and victor what is the success ratio that's something like, i mean you talked about something very interesting that you train them to sort of support each other or counsel each other so what is the success ratio of your model which well, we did it we did it we did this with crime victims in south london which in the nine, mid 90s and that was a particularly high crime rate at the time and we had all sorts of victims i mean we had uh, sexual attacks we had uh, grievous bodily harm we had families of murder victims that kind of thing and torture victims uh, who would come from other countries and we measured our success and it was 89% now let me clarify that we only took on people who had ptsd who were traumatized right and 89% of them within 10 sessions or less okay. and as i say on average 5 or 6 were no longer traumatized we give them a sense assessments at the beginning we give them assessments at the end and so as i say 89% over that period in the mid 90s was our success rate and it's we we've got better since the the figures have improved i have a colleague who works mainly mainly with firemen and other first responders and he t- typically does one session because he's called in to address one specific incident and he gets results like that after one session on the more general level with somebody who's been kidnapped sent to another country made to be a domestic slave or a sex slave or whatever and then sort of been rescued they're going to take 6 7 8 sessions 
Yeah, all right. But that's pretty good, you know, the success ratio. Also, do you want to talk about a little bit about your work you're doing in United Kingdom? I'm actually in Spain. I was born in England. I am half Ukrainian, quarter Polish and quarter Russian, okay. which is an interesting mix mixture. So I'm watching the news now with trepidation because my, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents family came from Odessa in Ukraine, okay. which is the Russian trying to target at the moment, which raises the whole issue of what happens when you have a whole country that gets traumatized, which is in the process of happening when you get millions of people who are being traumatized. And what I realized quite some time ago was there's never going to be enough mental health professionals in the world ever. You can just never train enough to yeah. cope with the amount of trauma that's going to happen. So yeah. that's why I'm very keen to do peer counseling in different countries where it's really needed. And what we've spent, our, our techniques have tried and tested over the last 40 years. Yeah. But what we're trying to do is evolve our training method so we can train lay people, people who maybe not been to university, certainly people whose first language is not English, how to do this, this, this technique. And that's what we've been perfecting over the last year and a half. In fact, since COVID started, to do this and to do it online. And do you see, as far as uh, this sex trafficking is concerned, do you see a trend post-COVID that it has it increased, the trauma has increased and when we were in a normal times or is there any comparison which you have done? I don't know. I can't answer that one. Okay. I, I, I do know that the idea that you can go online with somebody and get help no. is now much more prevalent, which is great because it means that people are much more willing to come forward. There's still a huge problem of people saying, yes, I'm traumatized, but I don't want to see a therapist. Yes. And this is a problem right across the world in all different cultures. And I've spent a lot of time trying to work out what the answer is to that. And I don't have the answer to that. Wow. So what we, spent, what we started doing some time ago is taking our techniques. Can we put them online in an app? Now, other mental health apps, as far as I know, don't work very well. Nobody's come out and said, look, I've got this app and you just play with it for a few hours and then your mental health's improved. Right. You know, you, you get slight improvements or whatever, but nobody ever got cured of a mental health condition from an app, as far as I know, and I'm willing to be corrected. And we're trying to do something that's really never been done before. Can we cure PTSD and or anxiety and or depression with an app that is self-administered without the use of a therapist. In other words, make the client the therapist so they do these techniques on each other. And we're in testing at the moment to see if we can do this. We are fairly confident we're going to be able to pull it off. Fantastic. But it will take some testing and some trials. Because yeah. there's always going to be a huge proportion of people who yeah. say, no, no matter how badly off I am, I don't want to talk to anybody. Right, I understand. So thank you so much. I'm sure that, you know, people will love to hear about, especially the trauma victims, they will love to hear about your techniques and they can look up. We will have in the description, we will have your links so they can reach out to you if they want to. Thank you so much for giving me insight into the mental health issues faced by traffic survivors. My pleasure. Thank you for interviewing me.